Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery Artist Talk Series for our current show, the 2021 Biennial Juried Exhibition, juried by April Tsunami, Jessamy Jones, and Kevin Lyles. Today we're thrilled to present Lee Brooklyn, one of our 53 exhibiting artists, but first there are just a few housekeeping items to go over. Everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode, so feel free to utilize the chat function in your control panel to ask questions. We will monitor your questions throughout the presentation and be sure to leave plenty of time to answer them at the end during the Q&A portion of the hour. Next, live captioning is available for this artist talk and you can access those by clicking on the closed captioning icon and selecting show subtitle. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation in bandwidth for internet stability. So if one of us freezes or the sound fluctuates, thanks in advance for bearing with us. I promise we'll keep on rolling. And lastly, to get everyone comfortable, go ahead and click on the chat function in your control panel and say hello and let us know where you're tuning in from. Okay, thanks everyone. And now to you, Lee. Hey everybody, thanks for joining me. Um, my great artist talk, we're starting off here. Um, this is my piece that was in the show uh, there at Rife Gallery called Him. Um, I'll get back to this piece in a little bit. It's part of my series called uh, Voices of Humanity. So I want to kind of start at um, the beginning of where everything started for me. Um, I was in high school and I didn't know much about painting or anything about the art world. And I made this piece, this painting on the left, I still have it. I made this piece, I copied it off the cover of a magazine. I was like um, one of those kind of kitschy, tacky art magazines. You can buy prints of old masters and stuff to hang in your house. And I saw the cover and I was like, I'm gonna paint this for my mom for Mother's Day. Um, so I did, and you know, it didn't look quite as good as the one on the cover, but it was pretty good. It was, you know, one of my first paintings. And then my teacher, without me knowing, entered it into uh, the Scholastics Art and Writing Awards, and I got a best in show. And I was maybe overreacting. I was thinking, I'm going to get in trouble. I, you know, copyright infringement. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and uh, then, so then I went to nationals, and it won again, and. Then I got really paranoid, probably overreacted and said, I'm going to withdraw my award because now I feel like uh, I'm better than I thought I was. So I was like, I'll, I'll come back next year. I'll, I'll like really put some effort in. So that was the very start of me, I think, taking the whole art thing seriously. So then the next year, um, I got this book on how to do um, photorealistic portraits. And my art teacher kind of turned me on to like what was juxtapositioning and uh, putting, you know, different things where they don't belong and making this kind of like surreal vibe. And so I started doing this um, and I created this drawing on the right. I think I was about 16. I did this drawing. The other one was probably 15. Um, so my junior year of high school. And this piece was inspired from a kid in my class who mentioned somebody got died in a, a drunk driving accident and you know you're young and you're, you're you're partying and I'm like oh I'm gonna like you know you're kind of like drinking your life away and so that's what this piece was so I like I posed you know using a little not even an iPhone because I didn't have it back then just the camera and took a bunch of pictures posing with this bottle and then I like kind of superimposed myself in the bottle like as if I was dead um and anyway, so that piece then went into the local Scholastics Art and Writing Awards. I got a best of show again. And then I went to nationals. This time though, before I had got best of show and a silver, this time I got best of show. And then I went to nationals in the best of show category and I got uh, a gold. And so this piece, then I went to New York and my I'd never been to New York before. And it just, you know, here I am, I got these two medals around my neck I'm like where am I you know I'm with all these like private art school students I just went to Elyria High and like it was crazy I, I think I had looked up the statistics and only like 12 people got that award I think out of like 350,000 and my eyes just kind of opened up and I was like 
you know, maybe there's something to this. I don't, I didn't come from like an artsy family, you know, we're very blue collar farmers, factory workers. Um, my, my mom was creative, you know, she decorated cakes and stuff, but this was all very foreign to me. And I decided I really liked these drawings, these kind of surrealistic portraits I was doing it because I liked realism, but also kind of like really wild things. So I was like, I'm going to do a lot more of these drawings, right? So I started doing all these drawings here. There's about told, I put a few in here. I didn't put them all in here. I put, did like, it's probably about 20 of them. And uh, so this one on the left, that's actually my mom. And I was called Breaking Free. And this one actually was shown down in Columbus, very close to Rife Gallery, uh, maybe around the corner, in fact, by the Capitol building. And so there I am, you know, a typical teenager, you know, my mom's controlling me and I'm trying to get away and like cutting the strings. Um, and then this one in the middle was called uh, Breaking Down, I believe. And I was, you know, I entered a lot of shows and I, got, I was feeling the stress of it. And I kind of also liked um, taking my face and seeing what weird effects I could do to it. So, you know, I, I drew my face and then started adding in all these cracks to it. And then the one on the right, I think it was called Melting Away. Um, that one is very creepy and they could, there's some really creepy ones. Um, but again, it was just kind of me testing these different effects on my face, but the one on the right, I remember it was shown at the Capitol building, um, from some, I think it was congressional district art show and they, they put it up on this big screen. They had it projected with all the students and people from all over the country showing their artwork. And I remember when mine showed, everybody went, <gasps> Cause it was this, you know, horror film of a thing in the Capitol building, but it's, it was cool though. I was, you know, my eyes were just being opened up at this time because again, it was like, I knew nothing about any of this. And all of a sudden I'm kind of like, you know, I'm in New York and I'm in DC and I'm like seeing all this stuff. And I'm like, there's something to this, you know, I, I need to like, I need to, to do something with this. Um, and then, so here's some more, you know, um, more effects this was like spaghetti head and then and you know I made myself uh out of these puzzle pieces called it puzzled and I was really playing into this whole like juxtapositioning very illustrative I remember my art teacher telling me you know I should go into illustration I didn't even know what that was and um so I did a lot of that I uh and then I also um I remember so I was like this was in downtown Cleveland I was probably 17 around then. This was my very first oil painting. So I don't have a great picture of it. Um, I still have it though, but this, this piece is important because I kind of loop back to this, this, this particular piece and what I was doing here, walking down the street, you know, downtown Cleveland. And essentially, I guess I was doing street photography and taking pictures of people. And I saw this guy sleeping here on these steps and took his picture and then you know, I painted from it. And this one, I think I also put in the scholastics, very, very focused on scholastics. I was trying to get a good scholarship, but this, I come back to this part. So, and then this is again, here's my, for my, one of my first sculptures I did. I'd never, it was the first sculpture I did. So I don't really have great pictures of it because um, I knew nothing about armatures and supports for things. So this whole sculpture as I hollowed it out collapsed one day and just got destroyed so these are the only pictures of it ever I actually sculpted my grandmother because before I had did a drawing of my grandfather in his military uniform and I felt like I needed to do something for her too but it kind of creeped me out having this sculpture of my grandma so I wasn't too upset that it that it uh broke but I knew nothing about sculpture so this I come back to as well it's funny because things keep looping back for me. Um, so then I enrolled into the Columbus College of Art and Design right downtown near Rife Gallery. And this was a piece I did. I, they wanted us to do portraits before we went there. Um, so this was before I went to the school there. We, and we all did our self portraits and they hung them all up of all the students that were coming in. Um, so I was there for one year. I, you know, I, pick, I wasn't, I think I got there and I felt like I wasn't being challenged enough. And I ended up withdrawing from there. 
Um, maybe I should have gave it more of a shot, but you know, that's life. And so life goes on. So um, it was what it was, but things come back. So anyways, I withdrew and I was like, what am I going to do with my life? Um, yeah, I've moved back kind of home and I went to the community college and didn't like it there either. But in my English course, I did like that class. I, lo I loved that, that professor I had. And she brought in a lawyer to talk to our class one day. And I remember a few days before that, watching the news and they had found a young girl's body and they identified it through a facial reconstruction from the skull. And I was like, oh, wow, that's so cool. I'm like, wouldn't it be great to like use my artwork to do something good? Because think how, like to have that closure for the family, like what a nice thing for them. I mean, it's sad, but that closure means a lot. And I was like, man, I, I wish I could do that. that. That would be really cool. And I like the science behind it. I like anatomy. So, and I was also like, who does these courtroom drawings, right? So I was like, I'm gonna ask this lawyer. So I go up to him after he's done talking to our class. And I say, you know, who, who does these courtroom drawings and like the facial reconstruction stuff and the skulls and all this. And so he's like, oh, well, there's a book called, you know, on forensic art by this girl, Karen T. T. Taylor. And Karen T. Taylor did all the illustrations and um, all the, like when it's like America's most wanted and they're like, this is what the perpetrator looks like, or this is what we suspect this girl looks like if we did an age progression to this age, this is what they would look like. And so I was like, oh, wow. So let me go, I'm going to go to Barnes and Noble and I'm going to get, I'm going to look for this book. So I go there, I order this book and there it is on the left. Such a great book. It's really interesting. I really love that book, especially in fact, and if any of you want to do like portrait illustrations, I feel like, or portrait drawing or any kind of like figurative art, this book, the anatomy and just like knowing how it faces age and everything, this book's really helpful for that too, I think. Um, so you can see even on the cover here, these tissue depth markers that they put all over the skull. Um, so I read this whole book. You know, I'm at the community college and I'm get, I get to part in the book and it says like most people that are doing this like forensic scientific uh, art have a degree in medical illustration. So I'm like, okay, I, I need to look into that. Who does medical or biomedical illustration? And I Google it and I come across two schools in the country for undergrad. And one was RIT, the Rochester Institute of Technology. And one was the Cleveland Institute of Art. And I was like, wow, this is a sign. This is a sign. I had to go, to, I'm from Cleveland. That's it, I'm enrolling there. So I called, you know, Cleveland Institute of Art. I go, you know, here I am, there's the school now as it is today. Um, so I enroll, I go directly into the biomedical art department because I'd already done my foundation year at CCAD. So I go right straight into biomed. Oh, it was a challenging major, very challenging, um, but I loved it. I did, um, so again, we go back to this anatomy, like look at this, I'm, I'm, you know, we did um, life drawing, but then we put, you know, all the muscles in there. Um, I just, I, I really love, I love anatomy and figurative art, which is why, you know, I painted this, this guy for my, my portrait at Rife Gallery. And then we did kind of the 3D, uh, animations and 3D modeling. And so this shows like the ribosomes and making uh, your DNA. Um, I forgot exactly what I was illustrating here, but that's essentially what it was. You got the nucleus back here in the background. Um, and so the, I wasn't big though. I, I gotta say, I was not big on the 3D animation and 3D modeling. It was very not intuitive for me. It was a lot of I want a texture on something. I can't just make the texture. I had to like program in different things to get it. So it was not my cup of tea, but I really love like this anatomy on the left. I love that. And then we also, we worked with, um, it was such a cool major. And then, so we also worked with like the botanical gardens in Cleveland. We went over there and we were like illustrated orchids for their different um, displays and exhibits. And so this was my one illustration of, an orchid. And then we went to like the Natural History Museum. I mean, I just think the location of the Cleveland Institute of Art 
is so great because you're on, you share a campus with Case Western and you have all these museums right there and you have like the university hospitals is right there, which I get to because we did surgical illustration there and it's great. And then, um, so anyways, so I'm there and they created a new course on forensic art. And believe it or not, the same book was used for this class. I'd already read it and I'm like, wow, I felt so smart ahead of the game. So we had these skulls. Well, we did two things. First, we went to the Natural History Museum again and they pulled out all these skulls from the drawers of like real skulls from like the thirties. And we did like with tracing, we drew the skull and then with tracing paper over it did a mock-up of what the person would have looked like. But we didn't put clay on the skull. And so this is kind of a, a standard skull. This is nobody's skull here, but we, we went through the book and we did the tissue depth markers and they had, well, basically there was like three basic types of skulls. There was the Caucasian, uh, I think Mongolian is what they called the other, which is kind of like Asian, and then the African skull. And then there's the male female skull. And, um, and then they had like average weight and like emaciated and obese. And so I kind of went basic with an average weight. And so if, it, if they were like emaciated, these tissue depth markers would be much, much lower, much shorter. Um, so here I am, you know, you can see like just building this up. We made the eyeballs and it, we all, we built this face out of it, which was pretty cool. Although it was a standard skull, what's, what's interesting when people do when they're new to this and you could kind of like I was new to this so everybody's um reconstruction of this skull kind of looked like them like mine kind of looked like me and you could tell who did which one because it all kind of looked like them and that's very typical of people that are you know doing this for the first time but that was a lot of fun I really enjoyed that um and then like I said you know we worked with uh, university hospitals and we did surgical illustration, which was really cool, you know, getting to be like a foot from a surgery and seeing somebody's like heart beating in their chest. It's like, I don't, I don't know of any like other type undergrad, undergrad projects, programs that let you like see that so close. And, you know, again, I just love the anatomy and sometimes you couldn't really see. And sometimes the doctor's are angry, but you know, it's, it's so interesting to me. And so here's like a, um, I liked, I liked the heart, the, um, I mean the eye surgeries because it was, they kind of dimmed the lights and it was relaxing, you know, it was 5 a.m. and I was tired, you know, so getting to see like an eye surgery. Um, and then a friend of mine helped, um, explain this surgery in detail to me, uh, you know, cataract surgery, which is just, you know, really interesting. You've got the lens in the middle and they're like peeling back the layer and then they inject all this liquid in and kind of like suck it out and inject this little uh, lens in there. So it's really cool. Not in the, you know, and I'm not even worried about that surgery. I don't want to have like a knee replacement because that one was, that's intense. But uh, so yes, yeah, so I did that. Um, and then I actually started uh, freelance working for, while I was in college. Towards the end, I started freelancing for university hospitals in their gastroenterology department. Um, so I did these uh, surgical illustrations. I didn't do any animations for them. Um, so that one on the left, the one on the right, this esophageal cancer staging is being, you know, here's the issue is uh, if you do medical illustrations that, that people can use your work for educational purposes. So this artwork is being, the one on the right, this cancer staging is being used all over the world by different doctors and I'm not getting a penny of it. And it's, it's I'm not really sure what to do about that. It's, it's, it's frustrating. You know, I'm not in that field anymore, but I don't know how you would go about doing that if it's, you know, for educational purposes, what do you do? Um, but technically university hospitals owns that artwork. I did it for them so it's I guess it's their issue I got paid um so that's something to think about maybe you guys have a solution um and then I also did a couple illustration courses where you know I did these cartoons which 
were fun. You know, I really enjoyed doing cartoons. This was like a cereal box cover we did. Um, it's very relaxing. You know, the surgical stuff you had to really think about. And, you know, it didn't matter how beautifully drawn it was. If it wasn't accurate, it was useless. Um, and so this was very relaxing and just fun, you know. And then so my, my BFA thesis project then was on this uh, nutrition. And so I did this whole cartoon thing for kids. Um, and then I graduated and I moved all over the country. I moved, admit, three days after I graduated, I moved to California, so you got Hollywood, and then was there for a year or two, and then I moved to Vermont in the bottom right. Was there for a year. I moved a lot uh, with my ex, and my stuff was boxed up a lot. I couldn't keep doing the surgical illustration. I did it a lot, but I tried to do it. Um, the good thing, like Cleveland gives you access to their medical libraries, and you don't have that all over the country. Um, so I was but I did gain experience here because I had never seen all this stuff in the country ever before. So I was in, you know, California, then I was in Vermont, then I was in Las Vegas, then I was in uh, Miami, then back to California, and then back to Ohio. So I moved 18 times in the last 10 years. And it's been crazy. It's really hard keeping my career going. Um, but, you know, I'm relentless. So I kept going no matter what. And I learned a lot about different cultures in different parts of the country. And I think that also helps you to kind of find yourself because I think when you're stuck in one area for too long, you you really try to like, a lot of times you try to fit into that culture. So um, eventually you're just like, you can't keep changing every six to 12 months. So you just, you're yourself, right? So I was like, all right, I'm not doing medical illustration. I'm going to, but I still like, you know, I've always liked figurative art. So I, this was me in Miami. And I was like, I'm gonna, you know, there's models all over the place. I'm gonna get this model and I'm, you know, I'm doing her makeup and then doing these photo shoots and I'm gonna paint her. And so this is me, you know, my first attempt at getting this like reference material for what I would, you know, starting to do paintings. And I hadn't really painted in years, you know, I was doing a lot of digital stuff with this uh, medical, illustration and everything. So I'm kind of going back to where I was, I guess, in high school. I'm getting back there. Um, and then I moved to LA, right? So I started doing street photography out there and that was really inspiring. That was, um, I was doing uh, street photography in downtown Los Angeles in like Skid Row where there's like countless homeless people. And it's very eye-opening. Um, just is very surreal being there and hearing the sirens. I guess in Skid Row is the most active uh, fire department in the country, I, I thought I heard. And the smell and people staring at you is very uncomfortable. But I was there for the artwork because I wanted, I wanted to get some great images. Look, I mean, these people, everybody's so interesting. And so this helped doing street photography really helped me um, being able to approach people and sell myself to them very quickly and and also accept denial because you know I'd, I'd approach them introduce myself with a card you know hi I'm, I'm Lee Brooklyn oh would you I'm an artist would you mind if I take your picture for a possible painting and sometimes they'll just say no and it's like okay cool keep it moving that helps me when I approach galleries now for sure so here's some more people I took photos of all over and it was like everybody, you know, the police, this girl on the left, I think was a aspiring rapper. This guy on the right was homeless now, you know, he's Native American and part of this tribe and lost his leg in some train accident. Like just, you know, I met so many people from so many walks of life and kind of heard their stories. And it was just, this kind of started my series Voices of Humanity. So the piece I had in the show was a part of the series, although, that person was from Cleveland. So I kind of continued it on as I moved. Um, but here you can see like Skid Row and it's just like these tent, these full like setups they have outside on the streets. Um, it's really, you know, I think it's important to see all walks of life so that you can be grateful and that, you know, it's just, it's just really, it's really interesting.
you know, going from here and then driving through Beverly Hills, just this dynamic, you know, of how everything changes. It's really, really eye-opening. Um, and then I also started going to protests and photographing people there because these people, you know, I'd, I'd wait around till the end of the protest because that's when people, the angriest people stayed till the end. And I was like, I'm gonna really get some good shots of these. And it's really interesting being behind the camera because you get this false sense of security. Like you're not really there. It's almost like you're watching it on TV where you're, you're like getting close to get that shot. And it's, it's like, you're not there. And it's like, part of you is like the adrenaline's going. You're like, I gotta get out of here, you know? And then you're like, you just get closer and it's, it's really wild. So there's like women's March. Um, this, the girls holding up the Mexican flag. I was, I was in Los Angeles, March for Our Lives. It was, you know, I went to so many pros, just more so documenting everything. Um, and it just goes back to the whole street photography. So now I want to get into my process a little bit. Um, so this is a friend of mine, James. Um, this is in California. And he was a homeless friend of mine who uh, lived outside my ex's office. He kind of hung out at this bus station. He'd go to shelters here and there. Really, really nice guy. I called him King James because he was, you know, I'm from Cleveland and he was like six, eight, big guy, just so, so sweet. So I took his picture and then you can kind of see my process here um, of doing this drawing that originally was this text up here. And then I, you know, I did this underpainting and I'll have a video of this in a minute for you guys. And I do the underpainting, I start building up in these browns and I keep building it up. Then I decided, you know, I'm gonna take out that text, start adding color to it. Um, the underpainting really just kind of helps me know what I'm doing before I do it. Cause maybe I should, I'm, you know, I might, I'm gonna consider doing like a color comp before I, I get going. They had us do that in my freshman year of college. And I was like, this is stupid. But now I think, you know, there's a point to it. So I might get back to that. <laughs> and then, so as I'm painting, this is what I'll do a lot. I'll take pictures of it and I put it back into Photoshop and I mess around and kind of test out different colors. And then I'll send them to like my mom, hey, which background color do you like more? And I'll test it. And then sometimes I'll take like a, this is a good, a good technique is sometimes I'll take like vellum or something like plastic and I'll paint on the vellum and hold it over it. So you can actually see the color of paint. Cause as you know, digital doesn't always translate directly to the paint color. So here I am testing out colors and then you get the final piece here. Um, there's James. I just, this just captures his soul. What a beautiful guy. There's, so here's James. I brought him over. I'm like, James, he lived, he was literally down the street. You got to come see your piece. He was so happy. He was like, I feel like a celebrity. Um, now what's really interesting about this and, and kind of sad is that um, like two weeks after I painted this, well, it was, I was going to be on the cover of this uh, Art Voices magazine, which was a national magazine based out of LA. And I was like, I, I hope they picked James' piece for the cover. And they did because James, I just, I, he's so sweet. I'm, and I was, he was so excited. I was like, James, you're gonna be on the cover of this national magazine. And, you know, I showed him and he was so happy. He's like, I feel like a celebrity. Um, it's just such a beautiful thing. Um, so two weeks after he passed away and it was kind of like, wow, like here's, um, I guess so James' family didn't know he was homeless per se. They had thought possibly he was, but they weren't sure. And then his friends on the street and myself didn't know he was terminally ill, but his family knew. So after he passed, it was kind of like everybody came together and this, you know, it all came out kind of. And so this was this memorial they did on the street for him. They called him Big James. Um, and I even, I went to his funeral too with his family and I actually still talk to his, his sister now. I still talk to her all the time on social media and everything. And I gave them a print of this piece, all three of his sisters, um, but it was just very eye-opening. And then, so this, this again, um, this talk, this is kind of me now, this, I think this picture was taken in Brooklyn years ago. Um, and you can kind of see, I don't, I don't know how well it shows up, but I took multiple images. I usually, I'll take pictures of, 
an overall image and I say, hold that pose, right? And then I come up close and take close ups for my reference. And so you can kind of see, you know, these different pieces. It doesn't line up perfectly um, of piecing together the different close ups for my overall reference. And then again, I start drawing it. And you might notice that this drawing now has some more detail in it than the other one had. They're starting, but I started doing this cross hatching as a way to save time for me shading. And then people were like, oh, I like that cross hatching. And then I started to think, maybe if I put more effort into it, it can be its own artwork in itself. So this is this drawing. It's a pretty big drawing. It's probably five feet tall, six feet tall. Um, I haven't painted this, um, but I still have the drawing. I should probably frame it and do some show, but I'm kind of onto a new series at this point. Um, but that's, you know, kind of my process. And then I would then, you know, should I paint this, I would, you know, transfer it to the canvas and, and uh, start doing that underpainting and building up the colors and everything. Um, now this, okay, so this I did to show you guys kind of a process. So you can see before I hit play, um, there's the painting on the left. Um, and this is a smaller piece. So I didn't spend as, as much time as like a really large piece I could take months and months. Um, but you can see the drawing and then I'll hit play and you can see um, how this goes. I, so I'm kind of building up this underpainting with the browns. Um, and I like doing the drawing so I can work out all those details before I transfer it to the canvas. It's hard to erase on canvas. Um, so just building up these layers here, um, starting to add a little bit of color here. You can see, I think I started adding some like blacks and grays. Again, I was not, I should have done like a color comp. See, now it's like, maybe I'm gonna do this yellow in the background and that ends up changing. I decided I didn't like it, but I'm building up her skin, um, making that yellow, you know, and just come, keep coming back in layer and layer and building up more and more details. Um, yeah, and then I decided to add this kind of background into here. Because I want to kind of like walking away from the city, kind of very illustrative. This particular painting, I could see it as like a, a movie poster from like the '90s or something. It's kind of what it reminds me of. So you know, changing it up, and uh, this piece, I would say this piece could have took a couple weeks. You know, there's drying times with oil paint. I do a lot of layers. Um, I also feel a little bit rusty with my painting, so if I took longer than it should, but that's essentially the process there, um, like I did with James. And this is my studio, it's very cramped. I'm kind of in between studio spaces, so I'm kind of using like my sculptures on the floor, I'm stepping over that, I got painting, the scaffolding, there's, you know, paintings. Actually on the floor there, you can kind of see the in the background, by the curtain, you kind of see the piece that's in Rife Gallery right now on the floor. And then there's the painting of James there. And then I got an easel. Um, and the other picture on the left, I mean, I have this crazy calendar and probably OCD or something. You know, I got things so mapped out as to what I'm doing. And I have this mirror here so I can see, you know, my painting in reverse and step away from it without stepping away from it. Uh, it's really good for, you know, checking my proportions. And there's just, there's a lot going on there. I really need a bigger studio space. It's just overtaken my life at this point, um, but I'll get there. And then trial and error, okay. This piece, um, I love this piece, but it was a headache. Um, I really wasn't sure what I was doing when I did this piece. I'd never painted a full figure before. I never stretched a canvas before. You know, like I said, I did that biomedical illustration. We weren't painting. I didn't do a single painting at the Cleveland Institute of Art. Uh, I had no clue how to stretch canvas. This one, I was stretching linen, which, you know, it rips apparently very easily. So, I, you know, I think I stretched it like 10 times and don't know how great of a job I did. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm, gonna, I'm getting other people because, you know, I got to focus. And so this piece, uh, there I am trying to stretch it. You know, I started, I was like, I'm going to add, a, I'm not going to do the brown underpainting I thought on the right, you see. So I started like, I'm going to add it colors like this because I saw other artists doing that. I like to watch videos of 
you know, or look at other artists that I like and kind of look at the background when they're doing like studio interviews and like what's going on behind this guy, you know, or, and so that's kind of how I've learned a lot of things is looking in the background of their interviews and it's fine. And so I was like, I'm going to do like that guy's doing, I'm going to add these colors up and uh, it wasn't working for me. Maybe it will in 10 years. And then, so, and I even started adding color to this piece. So I made all this grass and this grass is a headache. You know, I gritted the whole thing out. Um, and then I was like, I was on a deadline. I was making this for a competition. And I was like, I'm not going to get all this done in color. There's too much. So I went back to the browns and then, you know, I added the teddy bears in after the fact. So when I was painting this piece, uh, my friend, she does cosplay and she made this outfit. And I, I was like, let me, let me come paint you in this. Let me take your photo in this outfit and I'll paint you. And she had this toy gun and her boyfriend's like, do you want to pose with a real gun? And she's like, yeah. And I was like, yeah. And I was like, let's talk about guns in America. Cause she had this target on her shirt. Cause she's supposed to be tank girl. Um, but to me, I saw a girl holding, you know, an AR 15 and with a target on her shirt. And that said something else to me. And so I wanted to show, uh, I guess represent the lives of like the kids that were lost in these shootings. So I was like, I'm gonna add these teddy bears in. And so here I am adding them after the fact, right? And so I'm painting this, you can see here I am, I, I drew the teddy bears, but I put them on this tracing paper to, to put them on the canvas here, you know, building up the layers, I'm painting upside down on this scaffolding because you can't raise it up with eight foot ceilings and paint the bottom, it'll hit the ceiling. So I was working upside down and turning my reference upside down and painting sideways and you know small spaces, but I'm making it work. So anyways, though, this piece I showed in New York and um, this little girl came up and was like, I wanna be like that when I grow up. And I was like, me too, because she is awesome looking, like what a strong looking woman that is. And, um, and then I, I, you know, I went through my, my ex was abusive. I, I left him and I was like, I'm going to build this army of women. Like I need some strong women around me. And I'm looking at my friend's picture and I'm like, I'm going to buy all this like militia military clothing. I'm going to start dressing women up and like these soldiers and I'm going to photograph them and I'm going to paint them and I'm going to sculpt them. And so that started the women's militia. And that's kind of like what I'm doing right now. So, but these ideas were kind of in the back of my head for years and they're kind of like coming to fruition now. So like this little crappy sketch I have on the left, like I did this like two years ago, three years ago. Um, and it was like, I'm gonna paint my friend with her kid, like the Pieta. <laughs> and, you know, I've had this idea in my head for so long. And then, you know, we, we both, me and her actually both were living in Miami at the time. Then I moved to California. We both moved back to Cleveland the same year. And now we're like five minutes from each other where we live. and. So I'm photographing her, I dressed her up. She's also an artist here in Cleveland. And now here I am on the right, you can see me, I'm like, I'm painting this. There's that underpainting. Oh, this piece, this piece really excites me. It's, it's gonna be good. And this is this one, the gun piece I did that was very, very strong piece. This piece will be just as strong, if not stronger. Um, but here I am, you know, taking other women that I met, taking them to these abandoned areas. I'm photographing them. Um, this girl on the right, she's really interesting. She was, her name's uh, Tyra Patterson. And I came through her, for, I met her uh, through a friend on Instagram. I said, you should reach out to this girl. She has a story. And so she's from the Cincinnati area. She was falsely, when she was a teenager, falsely accused of murder. Spent 20 years in prison, just got out. They, you know, proved her innocence. Now she's a major activist. Uh, working with like I think she works with the Ohio Arts Council and she works with the Gunn family and she's the sweetest person you'll ever meet and you know and the whole thing was like you know saying that we all kind of go through these struggles but we're just we're so strong we're coming together and so that's her she's a beautiful person and then this kind of shows my photo shoots um, it's really interesting so like this image on the left looks like I could be in the Middle East um, and here I am photographing my friend, you can kind of behind the scene shot. But the reality is, is, you know, this was in downtown Elyria and they were, you know, demolishing this building there. And I kind of snuck in, like, let's take some pictures here, but it's cool. It's kind of, you know, what they do in Hollywood, you know, like 
they'll make it look like you're at the beach, but it's just some alleyway. Um, and this another photo shoot, another girl I painted and working on some pieces. I loved her tattoos. And so now I'm here I am, I'm doing these sculptures too. Let me play this one in the middle. This is just showing uh, the sculpture. And then here's the painting I was working on in that video. So I'm painting, I'm sculpting. In the background of this video, you can see that, that piece with my friend with her kid. It's actually flipped upside down um, so I can work on the bottom half. What else we got here? And I'm doing all kinds of things. You know, I was going to the Women's March. I was helping them with that. I made these stickers saying like change is coming, the women's militia and they're, they're all over the place. I got, I got these t-shirts. Um, I'm painting on actual grenades. Um, I'm putting love on them, like love bomb. Um, Cause that's a technique that abusers use that, you know, I was, I was a victim of um, very, you know, I, I could talk more and more about that, but uh, this piece here on the bottom, it's like, I did this piece is, you know, kind of like of all these huge paintings I did, this kind of crappy little drawing got so much attention. Um, like the president of times, I think brought this and then the National Museum for Women in the Arts like shared the story about this love bomb piece. And it's just, it's kind of, it's kind of this whole thing that's bigger than just the artwork, I think. And then I started, cause I wanted to do sculpture. I, I went into this like full welding program, you know, since I left my ex and it's like, now I'm like a certified welder and I'm like building stuff out of wood, these display cases, you know, my fabricator backed out on me and I had to, I was like, I guess I got to learn woodworking. Like, you know, so I went to Case Western and used their labs and I'm doing all this kind of like masculine, I guess, stuff like Rosie the Riveter, you know? And so here's some of these grenades I was painting on. Um, these were at District Gallery in Cleveland. And now, you know, I, I just dropped off some yesterday at a gallery in Connecticut and there's a place out in LA that's interested in, in these two. So they're kind of all over and I'm going, I have more ideas with what I want to do with just painting on stuff like that. Um, and then now like this cross hatching, right? Like I said, it kept getting more and more detailed. Like now it's getting really detailed to where it looks like it's money. Like it looks like an etching. And so I just kind of came up with this new technique for how I can do these really massive drawing mixed media projects. So I want to do like this whole like wall mural of this cross hatch, like war scene with these women. And one, because the drawing is much faster than painting. I'd love to do it as a painting, but I also got to be realistic with all the shows I have coming up. Um, but so yeah, I did the drawing and I transferred onto here and you know, it's, it's, I'm excited for that. Um, yeah, and so here's another one I did over the summer. You can see on the left, it, it's, I love, I just love this cross hatching now. It just, it looks like, you know, just some blended drawing, photorealistic on the left, but up close you see all that line work. It's just so cool to me. It kind of, like when I look at it even, I'm kind of like, how did I do that? Like, where did I begin? Because there's so many little lines. And I know when I do a painting, I'm doing that many brush strokes, but you can't see it. And now you can like, you can actually like, I guess see the artist's hand as they would say. And so this was a collaborative, uh, collaboration um, with me and Amanda King and a bunch of students for a large mural that was in Cleveland. So this was in downtown Cleveland and I drew the women and then I, I left their hair blank and their clothes blank, which I've done on other crosshatch drawings I've done. And I had the students, we had them color in their hair and color in their clothes. And then I Photoshopped it all together into this one image. And this was in public square. I think they just took it down, but it's, it's a really cool piece. And I, I love this message when I think of peace, I think of chains being free. And, you know, I had a friend point out that that's funny because that's what she saw my life and my last relationship kind of being, but it's very, it's just beautiful. And then uh, back to, you know, this was my piece in Rife Gallery, and this was the Voices of Humanity. Um, I had, uh, from that series, I painted, it's not in here, but I painted a couple that I photographed in downtown LA. And I approached them because they were both wearing matching denim and blue hair. And I thought they had such a cool look. They had just gotten married and it was called Love. Actually, and that's sitting next to me here in this giant crate. Um, but 
that piece, because it was there, they happened to be trans. I had so many trans followers after that because it's such a tight knit community. And I, I just, you know, now I've met like other trans artists because I did the, also painted the same people as me. But this, this guy reached out to me because I did that painting and, and he was local. And so I met up with him and I painted him and, you know, I just, I loved his look. And so that, this piece is from that series. And that's it, you know, here's my contact. There's my website, my Instagram, my email, upcoming shows. This next year is gonna be absolutely insane. These are the, the for sure shows that I'm in. Um, I have a dual show in uh, Connecticut in March and then a solo show in Cleveland at Kaiser Gallery. And then December, that gallery in Connecticut wants to show me down during Art Basel. So I have to get pieces done for that. And then there's a bunch of tentative things, possibly in Chicago, LA, and Florida in between there. So there's just gonna, it's gonna be a crazy year, but it's, it's definitely gonna be a good one. So that's it. And I'm, I'm ready for questions. Perfect. So uh, we had uh, a couple of comments just saying amazing work, which, you know, no surprise there. Um, and then if you would like to, you can go ahead and stop sharing and we'll just pin the two of us. Okay. And here we go. All right. So um, I love that you root us in the history of like how you came to be where you are. Mm -hmm. the, the portion of uh, kind of the thread that, that carries through that I have seen just based in, in this presentation is a testing, a discovery, and yeah. then jumping fully in. So uh, can you talk a little bit about how you identify what to test next? Um, you know, I kind of, I'm very spiritual and I say a lot of prayers and sometimes I just feel like things get presented to me that I should be going this way. And when things, when I feel like when I'm going the right, through the right path, then the doors start opening and, you know, I'll, I won't give up if a door shuts on me and they, I'll knock a few more times, like, hey, you know, let's work, do something. But if it doesn't work, it's like, I've, I found, okay, so for instance, you know, I wanted to do that, This I wanted to do a mural with a friend in Cleveland. And this friend, you know, they kind of, you know, backed out on me, blew me off, blah, blah, blah. You know, I didn't have any mural stuff going. And then somebody reached out to me and was like, hey, do you want to do this mural? It's going to be in the middle of Cleveland. And I was like, that's literally the best place for a mural and it like just because it didn't work out the way I thought it worked out another way even better and so you know it's like if a door is opening for me this way I go to it and you know I kind of believe in fate a lot and feel that things are going to work out and they you know usually do it's it's when you know I keep getting signs like that's not the right person and I, and I try to listen to my intuition that if that doesn't feel right there's even if I don't know why something doesn't feel right, or if I don't trust somebody working with somebody, you know, my intuition has always been right. Now, if I don't listen to it, then I can end up in a bad situation and that that's happened before. And so, um, you know, as, as things open up, you know, this, this gallery in Connecticut, really good vibes from them. So I know I'm going, I'm going full in with this this gallery where there's other people that want to work with me and I just don't get good vibes from them and so I don't even know exactly what it is but I know that my intuition has been pretty spot on so I guess that's just, that's it I'm listening to my intuition and paying attention to the signs that's great so I'd love for you to chat a little bit more you talked um you touched on this a few times about the development of relationship and how that affects your work um, oftentimes to be central to even having uh, the folks that model for you right so can you talk a little bit about that journey a little more about that journey like how how have you come to the place of understanding the importance of community 
of uh, relationship within the arts community, outside of the arts community, and how that feeds your work? Yeah, so, you know, outside of the last two years, like the 10 years prior to that, I was very isolated. I had, I moved all the time. I was at home all the time. I had nobody to talk to. And I kind of feel like I became like the shell of the person that I was like in high school. I feel like I was like blooming, you know, I was, I had all these friends and I kind of lost everything. And when I left that, it was like, you know, I felt like I was lost and I lost this one little thing that was like, I felt like was my whole world was this one thing. And, you know, now it's just been so important to me to have, again, going back to intuition, though, is having good people in my life, trustworthy people, and, you know, hearing their stories and really just, you know, I'm trying to uplift everyone, you know, I want everyone, there's a seat at the table for everyone, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I need to um, compete with another artist, or our styles are all different, you know, I'm so happy for my friends and other people, and I see them doing well, and I think it's just so important to, you know, understand that uh, we've all gone through some things. And yeah, I think a lot, and it's very isolating. I think when you don't, I mean, if you don't talk about it, it's, it can be very isolating because you feel like nobody else is going through that. And so I think me being more open about what I've gone through has definitely helped other, other women in particular come up they've come up to me women have come up to me at shows and have kind of whispered in my ear like I've gone through this too I've had this too and has said like my pieces have kind of inspired them and they feel stronger and because you want to feel like you're not alone and that you have you know we all want to be kind of a part of you know that's just kind of our nation be a part of a community and you know just so I think it's just very important for me, even as hard as it's been to like, it's also been therapeutic, but as hard as it's been to like talk about things that I went through, it's, it's all for a good reason. And I think, I do feel like I had to go through what I went through to get to where I am today. Um, I didn't even know I was going through anything for such a long time. And, you know, it's just that community of, everyone coming together. I've just had so many people reach out to me. And it's, I kind of have, at times I've felt like, I'm not really doing anything. I don't know why, you know, you're coming to me, but I think it's just, we want somebody else who can, we can relate, you know, to what we went through. So I guess that that's what it is. It's, I don't even know if I've answered your question, but <laughs> that's what it is. Still important for the conversation. Uh, so we're, we're coming up close on time. And what I would love for you to do, uh, clearly you have carved a path for yourself. And that's, uh, there are so many different ways, right? There are so many different paths for folks to take. But I think it's also really important that we honor the paths that are taken. Do you have any kind of key advice for folks entering into uh, the arts? and like carving their path that you would like to share? Yeah, I think um, one, I think you need to kind of do your research and see what's out there. What's helped me a lot is one that I'm, I've traveled a lot and I've lived all over these places. I've seen the different art scenes and people from all over the country and, and other places, but even just going to art fairs, you can kind of get a taste of that from, because all the galleries then kind of come to one place and you can see what's out there because what you don't want to do, and it's really hard, is you don't want to spend all your, you could, you could spend all your time making this artwork and then it's this great series and then you look around and you're like, oh, it's just like so-and-so's. Like, and they're kind of known for this and they're around right now doing it. Like, it's one thing to be like the new, you know, Basquiat or something, like somebody that's like from the past and you're kind of like, reinventing it in a new current way that's a little different but if, it, if there's somebody out there currently doing work very similar to yours you got to look what's out there and what can you do that's going to make your style different I think that's important and then um you know for me it's like just I guess having like the chutzpah and, and the 
you know, the tenacity to go out there and like sell yourself. That's very, very important. Like I, I just got back from Miami where I was talking to all these art fairs and I was all these galleries at the art fairs and I was absolutely terrified because this was the first year I went down there by myself to sell myself, you know, before I had my ex was, you know, selling for me, but I went down there and, and people really appreciate the grit and they, they, they appreciate the grind. Like if they see you grinding, even if they're not a huge fan of your artwork, they might want to get behind you just because they appreciate you grinding so hard. And, you know, I was so scared to talk to all these galleries, but I was more scared of what happens if I don't, because if you don't, the answer is no, always. And so, you know, I just keep swinging. And so I think that's important, just to keep going. I think that that is a perfect note to end on. So uh, thank you again, Lee, for your wonderful words. Um, thank you all for joining us for this artist talk by Lee Brooklyn as a part of our programming for the 2021 Biennial Juried Exhibition. I'd like to give a special thank you to our jurors, April Tsunami, Jessamy Jones, and Kevin Lyles, as well as to the Ohio Arts Council's board, the Ohio legislature, and the governor who supports the OAC, this great space, and of course, Ohio artists. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye.